Okay, let's call the meeting order then. Uh, pursuant to the state executive order, which temporarily suspends the in-person uh, presence requirements and eliminate the limitation on remote case access of the Illinois Open Meetings Act due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the board is suspending the usual electronic audience and voting section of their bylaws and will allow all board members to attend this meeting and fully participate remotely. Becky, call the roll. Okay. Barbara Bennett. I, there was a here there. I saw yeah. your mouth move. There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. John Thies. Present. Lupe Mejia. Here. Barbara Jones. Here. Chris Shearer. Here. Sharice Hersey. Here. Beth Scheid. Here. Michael Weissman. Here. And I think that's got, oh, and Jane Shearer. No, Jane Shearer. No, Jane Shearer is your phone. Jane phone. Williams. There we yeah. go. Hi, Jane. Jane. <laughs> I got a Jane up there on my view, so I'm missing out. Uh, additions, corrections, or modifications to the agenda. Uh, um, yeah. Barbara <laughs> sent us a, an addition that she would like to talk about. So would you make a motion to alter the agenda? Oh, me, Barbara? Yes, you, Barbara. Okay, thank you. I, I move that we add the following item to the agenda, which is what, what are the library's plans in regards to the schools right now? And I know this may be a stab in the dark, but. So this goes under 10 discussion items, just making it more specific, yes. correct? Oh, okay. Thank you. Is that what you need? Yes. Is there a okay. second? To, is there a second to that motion? Yeah. I'll second. Beth Scheid seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, aye. 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 We got a roll call. But then let's call for the motion, main motion with that addition and call the roll. Okay. Barbara Bennett? Uh, yes. John Thies? Yes. Lupe Mejia? Yes. Barbara Jones? Yes. Chris Shearer? Yes. Sharice Hersey? Yes. Beth Scheid? Yes. Michael Weissman? Yes. And Jane Williams? Never heard her, but I guess she's there. Okay, do we have any public comment that you know of, Becky or Celeste? Oh, let me take a quick look. I meant to have that. I've got my email open. Give me just a second. I didn't see any earlier, but Becky's checking right now. Let me check real quick. See if anybody's added anything. Just a minute. You're not finding any? Not seeing anything. No, okay. Okay, we'll move on and we'll have John please give us a orientation as to what is a good board member. Well, um, thank you for asking me to do this. And Celeste and I have talked for a while about the sorts of things that we might discuss um, as a group, um, which uh, might help all of us be better board members in what we do. So let, uh, what I wanted to do was start by giving a little bit more of my own background. Um, and I suspect there's a lot of commonality with many on this board. Um, so I, I mean, I'm a lawyer and I practiced law for a little more than 31 years, something like that. And throughout the course of my career, I've just been on a lot of boards and that's, you know, a lot of professionals do that. And it's um, to, to me, as I grew up in a family of lawyers and one, one judge, it was just sort of was what you did. That's, that's part of the job description is that you, you got active in things. And so um, I kind of was up, was raised in a culture of um, the sorts of, not, not just the desire to serve, but sort of the way to go about serving. 
um, and why it was important and what you got out of it personally and what you what your community got out of it. So um, I, I've um, been on quite a few boards, the most significant of which was I, I was president of the New York State Fire Association. Probably many of you know that. That's a the um, it's actually the second largest voluntary bar in the country, bar association in the country, 30, roughly 30,000 members and loads of kind of day-to-day -day, uh, what it's like to run a pretty you know, substantial organization. And that was, um, if I didn't have the experience going into it, it gave me an enormous amount of experience about kind of what I value and uh, it fed, fed into what I value in great board members and great organizations. And um, I, I really think that knowing most of you well, um, many of you could be giving this talk um, also. Um, and so uh, that being said, I think it doesn't hurt to go back and kind of do a reboot from time to time about what your priorities ought to be uh, as you uh, as you serve and how can you, and we can always be better in what we do. So of all the places that I have served, um, they all, they all are different. And I mean, they all have new, different nuances, um, both uh, in terms of governance, um, in terms of the way that they're structured, the kinds of um, decision-making bodies that they have, the committee structure, the, you know, who the policy making, what, what the policy making apparatus is, that sort of thing. Um, so there are, there are differences, but there are some common things that I have noticed um, in the various organizations with which um, I have been involved. And there certainly are common traits of uh, the, the people that I think are sort of the top of the cream of the crop in terms of their board membership, the, the, the roles that they play uh, on boards. Um, so the, the, where I would start um, is, uh, in terms of probably the most important trait, is an understanding of the organization and a commitment to the mission. And you know, people come to a board in different ways. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they come to a board for the wrong reason, and they may not necessarily have a passion. Uh, or even or understand what the mission is of the organization. Um, but I think that's uh, really crucial. Um, and right now I'm speaking to nominating committees and those who do appointments um, that, uh, that, that they select people who have that kind of uh, background that um, provides greater evidence that they'll hit the ground running when they start to serve. And by the way, I, I think that everyone on this board uh, fit, fits that criteria. They, they're all that way. So when, when I was ISBA president, um, I had more than a thousand appointments to make. There, there were more than a hundred committees and not counting special committees that I had created that were unique to my agenda for the year. And when I went about that process, I um, many of them were reappointments, so I didn't have to start from scratch. But I cared about um, as we brought in new people. I cared about um, you know issues of diversity and whether or not they would add to the chemistry of the particular group. In some instances, um, uh, the, so I, I had um, three or more three or four specific projects that were unique to my year. I called virtually every single person and walked them through um, my own expectations for them, but also um, to, to confirm that we were on the same page about the organization and, and what their mission would be, what their job would be with that particular group. And so I think for, for any organization, the process that the decision makers go through to place people on the board is really, really important. You're front loading um, the, the, some variables that really do define or have a great impact on how successful the organization's going to be. And so I think that's, that's a, pro a process that um, can always be worked on in an organization, in my opinion. Um, and that's, um, it, it's, it's one of the reasons that it can always be worked on is because it's evolving. 
Um, so for example, one thing, one project I worked on at one point was uh, a board that uh, needed more diversity. But diversity is a word that often is um, misunderstood and it can have, it, it can mean different things to different people. And so when we created this, um, this um, approach, we didn't, we didn't, we, we were identifying a couple of uh, board members that we didn't want to call them the, diver the diverse board members. We wanted to call them uh, the underrepresented board members. And the theory of that was that we would allow, uh, in a sense, since it was the president, we would allow them to determine what was needed in the board. Um, and, it, and it was really up to the president to decide to evaluate that and decide what was needed. So in a particular board, um, we start with the, the criteria that I mentioned before, understanding the organization, having a passion for it. Um, but also, um, it, you know, they're, they're, we, we all have different um, gifts and I'm sure you all have figured that out. I mean, we're, we all have different gifts and we don't have to have the same gifts. And the best organizations are, are a melding, best boards are a melding of, of uh, differing or various types of gifts on their board members. Um, and so that's, I guess, the last thing I'll say about the, the nominating process. But once you get to the point where you've got a, a board that's more of a mosaic, um, then uh, the, the leadership, it's, it's your job to make sure you understand what the gifts are and understand the best way to put people to work. So you don't all have to be able to do the same things on a board, but you, you should um, uh, find, find, leaders should find a place for people who have particular gifts to, to put those gifts to use for the betterment of the, of the organization. Um, let's see here. So, uh, and that's not necessarily an easy thing because I, boy, I, I have, this is true of hiring employees as well, where you, you can, uh, I mean, I know a number of you hire a lot of people over the years and, and uh, you, you may not, uh, based on a resume, you may not uh, appreciate the characteristics that, that someone might have that um, the interviews are so important to be, be able to determine, get drilled down to find out what really makes the person tick. And I've, I've you know, hired a lot of people over the years too. And, and when you go about that process, it's remarkable. Um, you don't always get it right. Um, but, but if you take the time uh, to go through the process carefully, sometimes you'll, you'll tease out something that um, can be incredibly useful uh, to the organization. And th this, is, this is absolutely true of boards in my experience because they'll come in from different, I mean, we, we are generally, mayoral appointments, right? So we, but uh, I don't know that Diane Marlin knows very much about, you know, my areas, my gifting. Or, um, and that's true of a lot of us. So I think that one, one job for us um, as we lead boards in particular, it's it's to uh, try to get to the bottom of that and then make it to good, put it to good use. Um, So there, there, there are gifts that all of us should have. Um, it's true, we're unique, but all of us, when you serve, and I, I'm speaking really generically because um, we're, many of the boards I've been on have been not-for-profit, but I've also been on for-profit boards. And um, in every case, it seems to me, board members um, need to know how to be ambassadors for the organization. And so when we, are um, in the case of not-for-profit boards, um, say in Champaign-Urbana, uh, knowing the elevator speech for your organization, um, being able to, so in other words, being able to represent it well wherever you might be. Uh, and I, that's, a, that's a trait that every one of us should have, no matter how um, comfortable you are in that environment. Uh, there will be times where you'll be asked about, you know, what, you, what did you do on that Tuesday night? Uh, and it's an opportunity to, to do it. And another thing, so talking about gifting, some people are really good at fundraising. I know a lot of people don't like to, and many people don't like to do that, but, but some people are really talented at it. 
And so, you know, you want to take that person and you want to put them in a position where they can uh, make the most of, of that gift. Um, make sure I don't put do more. Okay, so there are a few other things that, I, that these are kind of pet peeves to me. Uh, and not just because I'm a lawyer, but uh, I think that a rudimentary understanding of Robert's Rules of Order is important. Um, and it's funny because not, not every lawyer understands this, so don't, but, but because I've been in a lot of meetings with lawyers where they don't understand it, but they don't realize, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a basic thing that all of us should have a pretty good feel for. Uh, and it, it's the, the knowing Robert's Rules of Order isn't just a, a way of kind of um, reminding, you, reminding you of those awkward middle school years when you were in student council. Um, it's, it is, uh, remarkable how much more pleasant board service can be if you if you understand Robert's rules of order. Um, or uh, I often joked about how you know you either you either should know Robert's rules or you should act like you know them, because most people are so intimidated by uh, be, being in that uh, in an environment where you know you have to you have to follow the rules uh, that they'll just kind of accept the person that acts like they know what they're doing. Uh, but the basics of Robert Rules of Order um, will, will be a great um, tool to make sure that you're focusing on the most important things to spend your time on. And so in most of you have never seen me around a meeting, but my, my approach to running a meeting is I will be pretty abrupt at getting through the things that don't need a lot of attention. And I will, and I will be very protective of leaving time for things that uh, do deserve attention. And that's, you know, even if it's something that's not an action item, I think it's very important uh, because you're setting things up for the future to have good discussions on a topic. And the, sometimes it's very, it, it takes kind of a meticulous approach. Um, I, w when I ran the Bar Association, we had, some very uh, detailed uh, agendas with lots of action items on me. And, they, and these meetings would go on for hours. I, I um, occasionally um, would map it out by the minute. I mean, literally by the minute. And the trick was not ever letting anybody know you were doing that. And, and the point was, so the things that were really pretty mundane or you know, you know, it might even be an action item, but it didn't need to be discussed for five minutes. It could have been discussed for two and that was the end of it. Uh, whereas th then you end up with the, the, the time to you know, talk about the stuff that maybe is the most interesting, might be long, you know, in a long-term way, the most um, important thing for you to discuss as a board. Uh, and that generally works. And you, you know, I, m most people don't complain if they finish a board meeting earlier than in the allotted time. Um, and by the way, Chris, generally that's true of us. So good for you. But most people don't complain about, um, uh, about being uh, uh, you know, in a meeting for a shorter period of time than, than was allotted. Now, one thing that goes into that is the agenda. So um, we, board members uh, need to understand the agenda so that when they're, read, when they, you know, they're just reading it five minutes before the meeting starts, they're actually prepared, they've read the materials. Um, and hopefully the, the chair, the president of the organization and staff have uh, the right amount, have identified the right amount of things to be on the agenda so that it's realistic that we're actually gonna get through the agenda in the allotted time. Um, and as I say, Chris, we, we generally do that and it's last. I know effort gets put into that. But going into it, uh, if, if, you, if you have a, an agenda that just, you, you just can't get through all of it. Um, that will leave everybody frustrated. Um, another important thing, and this is true for for-profit boards as well. Um, even, even if you're a board member and you're compensated, um, you, you still, um, you know, your time is really valuable and you want, you'd want to make, you want to uh, feel like uh, your efforts are appreciated. And so, um, I always think about, particularly for not-for-profit boards where everybody's a volunteer, um, you really want to respect their time and, and use it um, uh, efficiently. 
uh, and that will cause people to come back and renew and stay on as, as board members. That's that's one of the most important things that I've learned um, over the years. No one wants to sit at a board meeting and feel like their time is being wasted. So please be, be careful of that. Um, another few things um, is uh, some minutes. Um, obviously, from a board member's perspective, um, you need to know, re read the minutes and make sure that it, they accurately reflect what happened. I mean, we're we, we are benefited by a great secretary. Um, and so our minutes are, are really excellent. Um, that is not always true of organizations though. And uh, it's, it's not uncommon that a secretary will miss something, will miss the nuance of something. And it, it really takes uh, members of the board to identify that and, and, and do amendments uh, to the minutes before they are approved. So I, I, really, um, I really urge people to carefully review the minutes no, no, no one is intentionally making mistakes, but it's not easy when you when you're trying to keep track of what's happening in a meeting uh, to get every every little bit of it uh, right. Um, now, so a, a little bit on minutes, but more than just the board members' responsibility. Um, there's a there's a, a real art to doing minutes that uh, call attention or or memorialize. Um, the most important things that are things that are appropriate. I mean, begging the question. So what's what's the most important thing? So obviously action items need to be in the minutes. So we have we have a routine where we are approving our minutes from the prior meeting. Every every group should do that. Um, but then uh, I've also seen uh, secretaries that basically do a transcription uh, of what happened in the meeting. And that's a mistake. Uh, because it'll be almost impossible to find the items that matter when you have a transcription. Any, anybody can, I mean, you can just tape record them or you can have a court reporter and just do every word, but that's not, then they're not really useful. Um, and so another important thing to me in, uh, in, in boards is to make sure that the minutes cover the right things. So what are the right things besides the ones that I mentioned? It is, it is true. It's not just action items that can be useful uh, to have in the minutes. We, on occasion, we will um, have kind of a brainstorming session where we'll say, you know, who can think of new ways to fill in the blank? Let's say uh, new fundraising opportunities, if it's a not-for-profit that um, has that in, you know, in the activities that they do. Uh, let's have a, you know, let's go around and, and everybody think of some ideas for us to consider. Okay, well, that's not gonna lead necessarily to an action item, but it, it, it can be a great, um, thing to want to go back to later and you get kind of stream of consciousness um, ideas so that we uh, can, you know, can, can profit from them later. So um, I, there, there's, it's not an absolute, but there, there is a, it's a balance between a transcription, which I would say is a bad idea and just doing action items, which is on the other. There certainly are times where it's useful to note um, that there was a discussion and, um, and some of the specifics of that. Sometimes as a, as a board chair or president, I will say to the secretary, I wanna, I wanna be sure that you uh, record that, that you keep it in the net so that we can, we'll remember that we discussed it. And, um, and then if, you know, ho hopefully we'll, get, we'll have that there and then we'll, we'll have them organized in a way that we can benefit from in the future. So that's minutes. Um, So uh, just a word about preparation. So I've, I've mentioned a number of the things that everybody should do, and they're really pretty axiomatic or basic concepts. Um, for, not everybody is, is as comfortable about everything, though, in a board agenda. So for example, um, another group that I was president of, we had numbers that were not as comfortable with financial statements. And I wouldn't venture to say that everybody on this board is comfortable with, with financial statements. Um, some of you can read them and it's second nature because you're familiar with them. Uh, but not everybody is, is that way. And so um, all of us, as we prepare for a meeting where there's gonna be a financial report, obviously should, re should review the materials that are given to us. But um, if, if you're not comfortable with that, then what I encourage people to do is to, is to reach out to staff um, and take advantage of other resources in order, in order to get up to speed. It's not, there are a lot of things that might seem extremely difficult and foreign to you, which are really not 
if if you just take a little put a little effort into uh, uh, learning more about the process. Uh, and I have I've done that in practice with with boards where we created opportunities for a controller to meet separately with board members. Um, but uh, but in in our case, um, I know that Celeste would be willing to sit down with anybody and go through to make sure that you understand all the line items. Um, it, so uh, and, and that's just one example. There are other things that we that we do that um, you may not be comfortable with and. You know, we, we want to make sure that there are resources for people to take advantage of. So in your materials today, um, there is a sheet that uh, Celeste put together that um, has some handy uh, resources that people can take advantage of to do pretty much everything I was just going through. So all of the basics, uh, that in fact, it's targeted toward library boards um, that uh, really do create great um, opportunities for people to go off onto the side and learn more that will make them better board members. Um, and to the extent it's not on that list, um, you can, um, as I say, reach out to staff or, or others on the board um, who, will, who will maybe help you go through this. By the way, one of the resources, one of the great resources for our board uh, is the strategic plan. So the process that we went through um, of course, everybody everybody now who's here went through that. And so hopefully you didn't forget all of that. Amanda did such a good job. Um, that, uh, but it, let's say you didn't remember it very well. Uh, we have a plan to look at that tells you an awful lot about the organization um, that will serve you well as you're preparing to make more policy decisions going into the future. So, um, I, but I did want to create and uh, you know, leave a little bit of time for people to ask questions um, and raise other topics that maybe would be good to discuss as a group. Uh, but those are just a few anecdotes and some highlights that I that I thought of, you know, as uh, it, as I look back on what I think makes people get better board members. And uh, you know, as I say, we we all have we all have ways to get better, and, and, and I certainly feel that way about myself. Um, and we all have uh, great examples to look to, and it, it's it's like uh, you know young young people in your own profession. Uh, one of the most important traits is to become a sponge to look to recognize recognize uh, really good characteristics or good talent, and uh, and then uh, watch it carefully and try to absorb it. And that's been my experience serving on boards over the years as I'm. You know, I, I, I can look back and I can think of the people that I really learned from, and I think you can do the same. So with that, I would suggest okay. Celeste, first, uh, Celeste gets the first crack, so she's also on this team um, to add to that. Um, and then we can let people unmute if they want and uh, ask questions or make comments. Well, thank you, John. And the sheet John was mentioning is the orientation checklist, which I update every time a new board member begins. And I update it again with some of the new um, books that are available. So whether it's the, uh, the standards, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, that are now it's available on a flash drive, or whether it's the, uh, the new laws book, or as John said, talking with staff, we'll be happy to sit down with you if you have questions in particular areas. So thank you for your time. I'd like to add a couple of things. I have been very pleased for the year that I had been a, board, a part of the board. We've had a very diverse board. The one thing that has bothered me a little bit is, and Celeste and I have talked about this, and I'm looking at ways we might get to it, but we have never had, and we consider them to be a major portion of our audiences. We've never had any young people on the board. Uh, I think diversity has been good. Uh, I can remember, though, back when we had a board that we did not have city council on it. And I think that that I can't just recall when that happened, but it's been the last 20 years that we've added a city council person. They weren't added. They just took a spot that we had nine board members. But I think that's been a real uh, attribute. And at one time, I like to think that we had most of the city council members had been on our board. So they understood our problem. And I thought that was a great, great help. But we have had uh, people like Anho 
And then I feel like we don't use them after they've gone off the board. And, and I think we need to get them involved in the foundation or something of that nature. So board members learn a lot. And I think that they are still useful once they've left the board. And uh, I know that we've got Barbara Gillespie on the foundation board and she was a previously a, a board member. So I think that's very important. The other item I would like to at least uh, bring up is I think the foundation board because of their responsibilities in terms of raising money have a real responsibility to not only give of their time but give their talents and their treasures. I've never said this about the board um, because I don't think it's necessarily that I should have to say anything, but I did find this last year. Now, there's no way for me to, I'd have to go back and look at two years in comparison because we say people do not give every year, they give maybe every other year. Um, but as of um, about April, we had some board members that had not yet contributed to the foundation this year. Now that didn't say they didn't, contribute another time. But I find that by joining the friends or by uh, just contributing to the annual uh, fund, I think that that is uh, critical in this particular case because I think it brings to reality the need. And I know we all understand the need, but I think that we all have also contributed uh, our time and are ready to give. So I'd kind of like to ask feedback on those remarks. I can, yeah, I can re react uh, to the to the giving uh, point. So uh, this is this can be a touchy subject since there's not a, uni a uniformity in opinions about this, and and I've heard it, I've heard it described as there can be giving boards, and and kind of doing boards. I've heard it, um, you know, sort of divided in that way. Um, most of the boards that I've been a part of that raise money. Um, you know, you could make an argument that they that they should be seen as 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 quote unquote giving boards. No, normally, um, when people are sort of so stark about it, um, it's not productive because it it can really turn people off, even those that have the ability to give. Um, and so, the the way that I've handled it with organizations is that um, you certainly uh, communicate the value in board members giving to an organization. Um, and there's a practical side to that, particularly if you're involved in a capital campaign, um, you, you, the question will be asked, is, is the board, is everybody on the board giving? So there's a practical side to that. But I, but I really am careful uh, to have expectations that everybody needs to do a certain thing in terms of, of uh, financial gifts. Because I, there's so many other um, talents that people have that make boards better. I'll just, just one quick example. So I just finished a term as uh, president of Land of Lincoln Legal Aid, which is the largest geographic uh, legal aid organization in, in the state, 65 counties. And one of the really special things about that board is that we have client members, people who are eligible for legal aid, who serve on that board. We have about roughly a third. And Oh, it was amazing that these these people were serving, and they and they were just wonderful board members. But obviously, they're not in a position to give, um, or to give much. They might give a little, bit, but I never wanted to communicate a policy that this was a you know there was an expectation. And even it wasn't just the client members; there were others too that you know it was tough different times in their lives. It's really hard to understand somebody. Uh, everything about you know what the dynamics are in play. To, to say they should necessarily make this much of a pledge. So I, what I would caution is be, be careful about that. Obviously encourage that kind of participation, but be really careful not, not to make people feel badly if they can't. John, could I follow up on what you and Chris just said? And that is a question, something I've grappled with, uh, is making a board more diverse. Um, not just racially and ethnically and stuff, but the whole idea of being of a certain financial level and that some people really do feel like they don't belong on a board because they're not wealthy. And, and it sounds like, I mean, I love your example of how you put people on the um, legal aid board, 
because we struggle with that in a lot of organizations that I'm in. Um, you talked in the beginning about you coming from a culture where your family was used to that culture of being on boards. Well, how do you get people whose families have never been on a board for people to understand that they're welcome to be on board? Yeah. Um, okay. Can you can you all hear me? Nod your heads because no, yeah. Bar yeah. Barb was breaking up a bit. And hopefully, it's not me. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, no. That's okay. I think I got your question. Uh, okay. So uh, that to me is easy, and I know it, the, the question assumes that it's really hard. But practically speaking, it's about asking. It's about uh, talking with somebody and letting them know they have what it takes. And it generally works. If, if you, I mean, the, the, the most involved that, if you just think back in your own experience, the most involved you've been on a particular board, uh, it, it's usually because somebody asked you and they gave you the chance and they made you feel like you could really contribute. Um, are you all hearing me okay? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I just want to be sure that we're okay with the, the technology. So uh, I don't mean to, uh, to, to maybe exaggerate the, the ease with which that happens. It's just reality that there are lots of people out there that would serve if you just ask them in the right way. Now, so, uh, frequently people are just so busy that when you, when, when you do get that call, uh, you know, sometimes the answer has to be no. But um, I, I am a firm believer that frequently the reason why boards don't have the right kind of diversity on them is because we're just not asking the right people. And if we, if we tried to do that uh, to a greater degree, um, we would have, there's plenty, of, there's plenty of opportunity to do a better job at that. Uh, now that takes time for your leaders to, to do that, to, to reach out. Um, but if, if they will make the time, um, I think that problem gets solved more often than not. Is there any reaction from anybody about a young person a youth, from our youth audience being a part of our um, discussion group. Not what? Chris, you got, you got, you were, went off. I couldn't hear you. I'm, I'm saying, is there any remarks or thoughts about how we might involve young people in our process? Uh, because as, as of this time, we have never, and I know of, ever had anybody from the young people uh, anybody under 21 years of age, in fact, it's always been a little older than that, uh, involved in our process. And I, I think we need to investigate ways that we might be able to do that. And I'm, I am very interested in that. Can I, I say I, something? Oh. You can go ahead, Sharice. I have a comment too, but you can go ahead, Sharice. Oh, okay. What, um, a couple of weeks ago, well, maybe about a week ago for city council, and Diane was talking about an advisory board and stuff. And one of the things that I had um, that I suggested uh, when she brought that up was that um, we um, uh, uh, what's the word couple, so to speak, with District One Sixteen, and um, uh, try to make um, some kind of credit-based um, community service thing that where we get we would could get um, kids from junior and senior year to also be on this advisory board but for no, no other reason it's a great civics lesson for them for them to actually be involved in that I, I would consider the same thing as far as trying to uh, uh, recruit younger people uh, a younger person to serve on the trustee board I think it would be uh, and maybe even on foundation and the other areas. I don't know if we actually have that type of, uh, of power or whatever, but I thought it would be a good idea that it could be incorporated into the curriculum at, at Urbana uh, High School and maybe even Urbana Junior High. Um, they, we might find that there are some people who would be interested in library sciences just from because they were on 
they served on a board and they see what we have to go through to keep libraries open and to, you know, but, but it's a matter of, of course, interest as well. So, and John, you're right about, about sometimes you just ask. Um, I, being on city council, I had to choose a commission or something, you know, after I got on and in all honesty, it was, for me, it was between library board, I think, and the planning commission or something like that. And Diane called and said, okay, Jared's leaving. I would really like to see you in the library board. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that was one of my choices, but, I, but now you've just pushed me on the, you know, pushed me over the fence. So, okay, fine. And that's what I'll do. And I think, and I, and I think with, um, trying to incorporate diversity in, in, in all areas, economically, um, culture wise and all that stuff that it may be, maybe it is just a matter of, of sometimes doing something like, you know, bring your daughter to work day or, <laughs> you know, bring your kids to a trustee meeting or ha having even, there are a lot of youth groups and churches and stuff like that, that, um, would probably be interested in sitting in on a library board meeting and it may pique their interest in, in that kind of thing. So that's- I'm glad, I'm glad to hear Diane uh, interested in, in doing the advisory board. Um, the park district does that and the uh, conservation district uh, in the county does that. They have an advisory board and in fact, many times the board members come up from that advisory board and they, because they have been familiar with it. So I'm looking into what the possibilities might be, but I wanted to get some reaction. Yeah, and in my, in my opinion, it was a, a way to, um, what I told Diana, I said, we need to be prepared and we need to start preparing people so we can pass the torch because I don't know about you guys, but I'm hoping to be dead when I'm 105. <gasps> Uh, <laughs> so, like, I, I'm tired. <laughs> so, I just, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I know I'm not gonna be here forever, and I want I want to know that I'm passing on yeah. anything, you know, that um that would help. I found that my generation has been very poor in that, and and passing that passing this knowledge and, and passing history on down and traditions down to our, our, our younger generations. So I thought that that's, that was another reason why, it, why that advisory board suggestion that, that Diane came up with was a good thing. It's like, we need to be able to pass the torch and, um, and know that we're not gonna be setting the village on fire when we do it, so. <laughs> So yeah, so Charisse, uh, let me let me react to that. Um, the fact that many organizations have failed at some of these diversity pushes, particularly as to young people, does not mean you can't succeed at it. Right. So I I have um, so I've done I've spoken a lot of different places and I did service clubs and the like. And I, I remember I was one in. Um, Peoria or North, North Peoria Rotary or something like that. And so there are a couple of, of almost cliche uh, experiences about service clubs. And I guess you could say the same thing about churches uh, that uh, they can't recruit young people, that they're all dying. And this, this one in particular was thriving with young people. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I know of religious organizations that are, thriving with young people. Maybe not all of them, but some are. And there are lessons uh, in those places that all of us that care, because I think Chris is absolutely right. I, I'll add my, my view that you're, you're right on track with the value in young people. Uh, there, there certainly are obstacles to young people getting involved in organizations. It's true. Mm -hmm. but, but not every organization has, has failed at that. Um, so it takes a lot of creativity, um, and it really does boil down to uh, it, making the make, making the right call at the right time. When, right after I started, I, I got law school and was starting to practice law. One of the first calls I got was a life insurance salesman, 
right? So and he took me to breakfast. Man, you can imagine what happened next. And we've had a 30 plus year relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So he made the call and he, you know, and that's sales. But in this case, we, I mean, we are selling our various organizations and uh, it starts by just, just don't sell people short. Don't, don't assume that they don't have the time or they don't have the talent. That's the worst thing you can, to conclude that somebody doesn't have the talent is they probably have something that you don't have now. And boy, a lot of young people, they have, they have talent that we can't even come close to understanding. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And um, the uh, trustees association meetings at Illinois Library Association and ALA, they tell tons of success stories, putting young people on a board. And it is true. We always have an excuse ready about, well, they won't show up. Well, they won't this. And I think we need to give them an opportunity. And I have just been so impressed with young people in the last few months in terms of their response to what's going on in the world. And people in the, the young people in the environmental movement and just, you know, and in Black Lives Matter and all of this. And I think I would love to see us, uh, Chris, you said you were, <laughs> you wanted opinions. I would love to see the board have a young person or persons. Yeah, I think um, not to belabor the point, but I agree. I think inviting them kind of to, to spin off of what John was saying that really asking um, and reaching out. I think, Sharice, the idea of partnering with USD is, is an excellent opportunity. Um, I know my leadership started in these high school service groups, and um, I think it's more than just inviting them, but giving them um, some sort of responsibility and role that, that they can really commit to. Um, so that they have that buy-in, you know, they feel like they have a voice and they're being listened to. Um, and I know not even from youth, but even my graduate students that I'm working with, you know, I come from a very different field. Um, and I love sharing with my grad students. They're like, well, what are you? I, I'm like, I got to go. I got a meeting tonight. They're like, where are you going now? And explaining to them that this is something yep. else that I do. And, and yeah. I do all of these years of education and experience and something very different and bring it to a different world. And I think that's that's very beneficial in both the library board world, but I also learn a lot that I take back to um, to my healthcare world. Um, so I think we do have talents that we can um, constantly be an advocate. So um, everybody always wants to know what's going on at the library now. Um, so it, it's really exciting to be able to share that um, with with all kinds of different people. Um, and then going back to earlier comments, just before I forget on the board orientation checklist as one of the newest board members, um, I, again, coming from a very different background, this was my first intro into the library world as I came onto this board. Um, and that board orientation checklist, um, I devoured it and went through it piece by piece. Um, and, and my husband would laugh at me because I'd be sitting up, you know, going through PowerPoints and just reading voraciously over everything that was in there, but it was very well organized um, and really helpful for me to get a good understanding. And I'm still diving through some of the recommended reading and um, just kind of things that I've spun off. So it's been very, very helpful um, as a new board member. So thank you, Celeste, for all of that organization. Me too. <laughs> Even... And I've been on here longer than you, but yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to still go through the other thing. The other thing, Chris, though, too, is, is I know you're talking about the giving thing, and um, uh, I'll, I'll just take the heat off and tell you guys, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the broke diversity person on the board because uh, <laughs> I'm a caregiver, so I don't have uh, income necessarily coming in uh, except for... Um, a little stipend that I do get, but um, I have no problem asking people for money. <laughs> and before the before COVID hit, I had a list of people of classmates. John knows we've got some pretty wealthy classmates in the class of seventy nine, and I was already going like, "Do you donate to the library?" And they're like, "Uh, uh, well, I, oh, okay, so I'm gonna hook you up with Amanda." because she needs money, we need money, so I'm gonna hook you up. But the thing is, is then, I, and I swear to God, it was like two weeks later, COVID hit. <laughs> and so I'm not seeing these people in social settings yeah. anymore. Same with me. You know? yep. Yeah. So it's just one of those things, but I, 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 I 
told Celeste, I said, oh, I got, I have a few um, uh, classmates that um, they're not hurting. One of them owns the, the marathon or something. And it's like, oh, dude, no, come on. Oh, two of them own the marathon. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm going to be hitting you up. Let me get, the, let me get your digits. So, I, <laughs> so I can... You're tough to say no to. Oh, yeah. A smile goes a long way. <laughs> you're you're going to be eligible for our foundation board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Questions. We, we, we probably have spent more time on this than I thought we would this evening, but I'm glad to have had the discussion. If, are there other questions or thoughts? No, I'm good. Well, thanks for your uh, attention. And I, I'm sure there'll be further conversations like this. A lot of, a lot of good ideas, I think, came out of it that uh, uh, Chris, uh, you and Celeste can, can take uh, as you move into the future. Thank you, John. Let's move along in our agenda and ask Celeste to give us a report on the report that she's filing for last year's successes in the library to the city council. Hi, everybody. I will be brief with my remarks. You received a copy of the IPLAR, the Illinois Public Library Annual Report um, in your email today. It's got all the details. And so please take a look and uh, if you have any questions about it, let me know. We will file the IPLAR after um, Jane Shear, I mean, Chris Shear and um, Barbara Bennett, let me know that they feel that the numbers are good. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. They have to sign off on it. I have signed off on it. We have got all the numbers in. So what I thought I would do, um, because there's a lot of numbers and because of course with COVID really hitting the community hard march forward, if you look at the annual report statistics this year compared to last, our numbers look kind of sorry and sad. Um, but what I want you to hear is that we actually had quite a good year. And so I wanna highlight some things for you. Um, and I will share my screen. Becky, I will have you share my screen for me, or uh, allow me to share my screen, or make me co-host or something. Ha ha. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Okay, so again, the reason we look at the numbers is not for the sake of the numbers, but to see what we are doing and how we can serve our community. So we'll start with a, just a quick shot of Megan's garden, which uh, is here because of donors and their kind generosity and enjoyed by children. Um, every day they come into the library. Oop. So I wanted to look at card holders with you. You will be impressed, I hope, to see that we actually had more card holders at the end of the fiscal year, the gray number, than we did at the beginning of the year. And so you can see in February, we were, um, the numbers were going down, number of card holders, and we really were ramping up our um, efforts to increase people um, having cards as it was. And then you can see that our efforts worked and that we increased cards um, by 700 over the year before. So since we had gone down a bit, that's even better. We did this in a couple ways that we talked about with you. Um, we reached out to the schools, we reached out to the neighborhood associations, and we talked a lot about those electronic cards. So if you couldn't come in to get a card in person because we were physically closed, you could apply online, staff were checking to see that you had an Urbana address, and then you could use all the e-resources. So we're really happy to see that number increase quite a bit. So you can see again, gray is fiscal 20. Our program numbers were actually looking pretty darn good up through February. And then of course they went down because we stopped having programs altogether. But if you look at the total number of programs, we were actually up by four in February if you compare year to year. So we were on an upward trend, which you can see here. And then program attendees, obviously that went down quite a bit. And we were down at that point in the year, we were down by 80. But 80 over a whole year of um, usually about 28,000, we were not concerned. And we had the fairy tale ball coming up and other kinds of things. So we feel like programming probably would have come out even if not a little bit ahead. Circulation. Now, circulation is an interesting one. We were up by over 2,700 checkouts when we closed um, 
if you look at the end of February. So you can see it's pretty close and then it was going up. And then of course it went down quite a bit. But again, year to date, end of February to end of February, up by 2,700. So that is a good um, a trend in the right direction. And if you wanna see what really picked up in circulation, of course, downloadables. So Chris, I know this is a number that's always, that has interested you. So the orange is this fiscal year. And as February, March, April, you can see that the downloadable eBooks and books and CDs and um, videos have become super popular. And this is in part why we shifted money in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 to have more resources for downloadable materials. We're still seeing the numbers are quite high. So also, if we look at the number of um, hours of computers, this was up as well. So you can see orange. We were, we were ahead of last year. So that was nice to see that more people were using the public internet stations. And then the number of volunteer hours was also up. So that was up by 337 at the end of February. So thanks to the great department heads who um, have jobs that people find meaningful and thanks to Eleanor for facilitating the whole uh, volunteer process overall, we were on um, good track to really, really increase the number of volunteer hours for the year. Notary stamps were up year to date uh, by 150. And some of those notary um, experiences can be a five minute conversation and stamping and stickering process. Sometimes it's a half an hour of staff time. So 150 additional notaries in, in the seven months, that, the eight months that it was can be quite a staff commitment. And it's a service that we are happy to provide to our community. And that's what I have is just some highlights of the statistics that you wouldn't see necessarily unless you just took that peek at the parts. Yeah, the overall number is not as robust as we'd like, but I'm pretty darn proud of all the work that coll our colleagues did. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to our action items. We have the, uh, do I have a, uh, a motion for any separations or deletions from that list? If not, do I have a motion to approve the action items for board of our July 14th, payroll of July 17th, payroll of July 17th, one year is year 20, one year is 21, payroll of July 1, 31, bills for July 9, bills for July 21, bills for July 23, bills for July 31, and bills for August 6th. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second to that? Second, Barb Bennett. Becky, would you call the roll? As soon as I write down who motioned, yes. Okay, Barbara Bennett? Yes. John Thies? Yes. Lupe Mejia? Yes. Beth Scheid? Yes. Chris Shearer? Yes. Cherise Hersey? Yes. Barbara Jones? Yes. Jane Williams? Yes. And Michael Weissman? Yes. Are there any opposed? I didn't hear any. So we approve the consent agenda. Moving on to the action items, I guess we've kind of got report from Celeste on the 7-2 versus 9-1. Is there anything you want to add, Celeste, on at 9-1? Um, no, unless people have questions. It is very close to what you sent last month. There's just a couple extra pieces of data that we didn't have. Okay. The next item of business uh, is the re resolution 20, 2010 for the exception of the gift. Chris, we have to vote on the first one. We have to vote on 9 1. We need a motion on a second. Oh, on the report. Yes. Saying. Okay. The annual report that you had in your packets last month with the few additions, I guess we could say. Um, is there a motion for that? So. This is Lupe. I move to approve the annual report. Okay. Is there a second to that? Second. Second. Becky, would you call the roll? Okay. Be Barbara Bennett? Yes. John Thies? Yes. Lupe Mejia? Yes. Beth Scheid? Yes. Chris Shearer? Yes. Sharice Hersey? Yes. 
Robert Jones? Yes. Jane Williams? Yes. And Michael Weissman? Yes. Okay. Are there any opposed? If not, that is approved. Okay, now the resolution 2020, 10, number 10, is a re resolution to accept a gift. Um, it's a $650 gift that is designated for CDs. Do I hear a motion to approve that resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Becky, would you call the roll? Barbara Bennett? Okay. John Thies? Yes. Lupe? Yes. Beth? Yes. Chris? Yes. Sharice? Yes. Barbara Jones? Yes. Jane? Yes. And Michael? Yes. Seeing no opposition, that is approved. There's a budgetary amendment listed in the, um, I think in Celeste's report, and that's the $650 gift that has been budgeted for the CDs. Do I have a motion to approve that budget amendment? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Becky, Becky who are you gonna call on that? I didn't catch who, who seconded that. We had several. I'll take the second, Becky. Okay. <laughs> we'll give it to Lupe. She spoke up again. Okay. Okay. Barbara Bennett, you need to unmute Barbara. You need to unmute so we can hear you say yes. Yes. Okay, there we go. John Thies? Yes. And Lupe Mejia? Yes. Bar Beth Scheid? Yes. Chris Shearer? Yes. Sharice Hersey? Yes. Barbara Jones? Yes. Jane Williams? Yes. And Michael Weissman? Yes. Thank you for that. Moving on to the um, insurance premium. Um, might I ask Celeste, is this a, a, an annual premium that we pay once a year? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's what I thought, okay. Do I have them? Is, are, are there any questions about it? If not, um, do I? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out, is this like um, insurance for the building, insurance for the, the um, books, the contents, people, what? exactly does it cover insurance the last yep i was just waiting till she was done so it's um it's not our cyber security insurance which is a separate policy it's not the health insurance but it's all the other pieces so liability okay. building contents mm -hmm. on our different locations because we've got this building and the tupper building next door and then we also have insurance um across the street at lincoln square mall Okay, so this ensures all the contents of those, the contents of the building. And the buildings themselves and the property. Oh, okay. And liability as well. For yes, and DNO, it's got all the, yes. Yeah. yeah so if anyone time, wants to see the policy, please let me know. You're welcome to it. Celeste, I just have a question. I thought it, at least at some point, the contents of a library were um, defined as priceless. <laughs> so... No, I'm serious, and that the contents were no longer insured. Oh. So there's um, there, there are different numbers, and so we do have values on some things. But for example, like um, if the Tepper building to were burned down, those are unique items that there are no replacements for. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So please let the Tepper building not burn down. <laughs> God. I would assume that the collection that is at Lincoln Square was added in this year. Yes. Okay. Do I hear any other questions? If not, do I hear a motion to approve that expenditure? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Bar Bennett. Or, <laughs> all those, please call the roll, Becky. If Barbara Bennett. Yes. John Thies? Yes. Lupe Mejia? Yes. Beth Scheid? Yes. Chris Shearer? Yes. Sharice Hersey? Yes. Barbara Jones? Yes. Jane Williams? Yes. And Michael Weissman? Yes. We thank you for that. Okay, the next item is the municipal.
uh, invoice for eleven thousand uh, dollars. Are there any questions? If not, do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Is Beth moved? Is there a second? Second. Barb Bennett. Becky, please call the roll. Yes. Barb Bennett? Yes. John Thies? Yes. Lupe Mejia? Yes. Beth Scheid? Yes. Chris Shearer? Yes. Sharice Hersey? Yes. Barbara Jones? Yes. Jane Williams? Yes. Michael Weissman? Yes. I thank you for that. Okay, I don't see any items unless somebody has something that I'm not aware of for the discussion. So let's move on to the uh, Chris? liaison. Yes. Chris, this is yes. the uh, discussing the how the library is preparing and working with the schools. Oh, yes, Just, that was the Barb's re response. And that had to do with the identifying students with their uh, school identification card, I believe. Barbara, do you want to explain that? I was just generally curious about what the library strategy was going to be with the changes in the school schedule. For example, I know the Champaign Public Library is worried about students being in the building and, and, and crowd control and stuff like that. And I just wondered what kind of challenges you're uh, dealing with. It's, it's a good question. Thank you. We have been um, and your your timing was perfect um, for a couple of reasons. One, because we've been working on this very specifically. We were working with Joel Spencer, one of our teen librarians. He and Jordan work with the teen open lab and they've been um, zooming with the teens and Facebook living and doing the different events with the teens online. Um, so we asked Joel Lauren, I'm sorry, specifically Rachel talked with Joel and he developed a plan so that we could have a, a good sense of what would be welcoming to teens and the whole community and we could be safe together. So to start from the top, the library is currently with a stage four of uh, the state's Restore Illinois plan. We are in a grab and go model for all patrons. And for us, grab and go means that we've got limited services to minimize contact with staff and other patrons. So we have got it set up so that you get an hour per day. And if you wanna be on the internet, it's an hour per day. So we encourage people to come in, get the items that they're looking for, get their documents notarized, use the internet and then leave. Oh, okay. Because um, we know that COVID is transmitted through the air primarily. And so the more people in the building for longer periods of time, the more likely you are to have community spread. So we feel good about our HVAC system, which has a two, two sets of filters and the finer set of filters are actually MERV 14, which Excellent. is a step finer than the MERV 13s you've been hearing about. So we feel good about that. We changed hey. the percentage of outside air early on so that more outside air was coming in um, based on the number of people, the CO2 being uh, released in the air. So we've made changes to make it a safer environment, but we've um, also done physical things like We've got tables out in the places that the tables used to live, but there are no chairs with the tables unless you're at the internet and you need a place to sit. So again, it's grab and go. So you what does this mean for, yeah. Michael, go ahead. Oh, you just answered all the questions. Oh, that was good. <laughs> good, so we've been working under this model since we opened on June 26th and it's been going well for us. Patrons are for the vast majority wearing masks and wearing them mostly where they're supposed to. There's some slippage, but when reminded um, people are doing a good job of wearing the mask where they're supposed to be. So um, a question that we got from Tom Kasich, he asked Champaign, Danville, Urbana, what, um, what are patrons, what are we gonna do if parents bring their kids to the library and drop them off to study all day? Yeah. And so we have a, a couple of responses to that. One, um, the rules of behavior the board put into play back in 2015 state, children under the age of eight must be under the direct supervision of a parent or caregiver age 14 or over at all times. So if a parent is choosing to drop off small children, we're going to get in touch with that parent right away because that's the library is not that place anytime. Currently, right. the library is not the place to linger for more than an hour for any patron either. So um, what Champaign is seeing is 200 people a day coming in from school after school. 
we were getting, let's say 50 to 80 students a day after school, but we're not gonna have teen open lab. So um, we don't expect once the students that were regularly coming for teen open lab, they're gonna maybe be going home and zooming with us. Um, we will have a librarian or a staff, different staff person at the doors to greet people maybe the first couple of weeks of when school starts to let them know what the rules are of how grab and go works so that we can welcome them. And then we'll have a person floating throughout the building. We did this also when we opened the building to the public generally, but we wanted extra friendly faces when school starts because we really haven't seen that many children coming in. There's a, a handful of teens that have come in a handful of times, but it's not, it's summer. Um, most of the time the kids are outside doing other things anyways. Amanda has also developed with our um, team of people through Adult and Youth Services and Archives. We are gonna be um, putting out a newsletter every month through the Urbana School District. So it's gonna be emailed out every month as part of our agreement with the schools, they're gonna send a newsletter to all the parent email addresses they have on hand. Uh -huh. And that email will talk about what is grab and go service at the library like? And so what are your expectations? It's gonna talk about what Chris mentioned that um, all the students now qualify for library cards and um, Lauren that I mentioned earlier, and I will mention her in the right context now, Lauren has been working with Kim Norton and Amanda and Dawn and Rachel, and they've been pulling together a way that kids can use their student IDs as their library cards. So the schools have had a lot of um, fish to fry, so to speak. They have a lot of priorities happening right now, but we are working towards this goal together. And so we'll be telling parents what their options are and then talking about the e-resources because there's all the homework help as well as, you know, fun stuff for kids to do online as well. So there is homework help. I was curious. It's a Zoom thing? Well, not literally homework help, but the different resources that we have. But the okay. teen librarians are doing Teen Open Lab live. And so um, sometimes they did homework help at Teen Open Lab. So and I know they were doing, let's touch base with the, the youth librarians, or sorry, the teen librarians. And so um, again, within the context of, if someone had some questions about, I need to write a paper on X, um, the librarians could help with that. And the librarians will help anytime you call or email also. Okay. But that, as far as a personal face. So we'll still be here for the kids, but they're gonna have to follow the rules that all the adults have been following too, which is an hour per visit. Okay. And that's where we stand right now. Um, Barbara, you talked about kids getting out of school. They're going to get out earlier now. They're not going to be in school till 2.30, 3.30. They're going to be getting out in that 12.30 to 1.30 range. So we're positioning ourselves to be prepared for our greeters to be in the right time frame. So we, we've had great interest in seeing what's happening at the USD so that we can be responsive to the students' needs and get them what they need. Yeah. Um, the cafe is still closed um, because we know, we know the kids are going to be hungry, but we also know they're going to be fed at school. So kids will be leaving if they qualify for, for lunch, they'll be leaving with lunch. So they can't eat it in the building, but at least we know uh, before when they would leave school at 3.30, they come here hungry. At least we know now they, sh they could be getting food at school. So having the cafe closed for safety's sake for us is, um, should not negatively impact the students, which is a thing we did consider. Yeah. So if we have to move to some type of appointment only because community spread is increasing and we feel like being able to limit just a little bit more would be safer, then um, students would be able to make an appointment. Again, if you're an eight-year-old who wants to come, you need to come with a 14-year-old or older, but we would not limit reservations by age other than, again, having the appropriate um, chaperone, so to speak, or guardian. So we feel we are as prepared as we can be. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to know, I mean, I knew you would be, but I was just, people ask in Moona, you know, especially in my neighborhood. So Absolutely. thank you. Any questions? That helps a lot, Celeste. Uh, my colleagues, we've all been working really hard on this. We, we love our kids and we want to make sure we're all safe and that they feel welcome. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of balancing to do to make that all happen as best we can. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let's move on to the Friends of Library Report. Barbara, do you have something? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. I have a quick update, Barbara, that's brand new. Hey, great. No, we haven't had a chance to send it to you yet. Okay, great, thank you. The Amazon store is making about 1000 to $1,200 a month. I just got that statistic today. Wow, that's wonderful. 
So that might another be more, that's almost as good as our book. That's maybe as good as our book sales. That's so great. they've been doing a great job. Super. Very good. Uh, from the found, library foundation, I think the major item is that the uh, foundation is working on very diligently. I think the committee has investigated some other sources and found some good information as to where the investment and gift policies. And I believe that that will be voted on at the next meeting, which is a week from tomorrow. And if I could add one more thing too, more good news that um, Bob Switzer, former president, has been uh, elected back onto the board and he starts next week as well. Very good. Do we have anything from Heartland to explain? So I have a, just a brief report. So I um, was at my first meeting on, on the board last month. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, so IHLS has been actively helping member libraries promote the census. Um, so yesterday uh, they hosted a census reboot event um, titled Make Your Community Count and our very own Lauren Chambers was a panelist on that. So that's very exciting. Um, there is also an increased um, focus and emphasis on supporting school library members. Um, so this, to this end, they've developed new membership directories that they worked on over the summer, and they'll be sending out a series of back to school communications and town hall st uh, style meetings are planned as we go into this um, uh, back to school season. And then um, IHLS is also working with memory libraries as the reboot of L2 takes place. Um, so the L2 system was frozen as of July 31st, and there will be trainings and things forthcoming as we integrate into the new platform. Sounds to me like you're getting involved very deeply. <laughs> Are there any questions? Oh, I wanted to go back to the foundation. Uh, there was a just suggestion made that I really applaud to be able to create a video on why I give, and I think that we can get, I, it seems to me like those, those testimonials are a good way to sell the library. So I like that idea. Okay, I, uh, administrative report. Celeste, do you have other items that you wanna share with us? Yes, I'm gonna introduce Donica who has a, a teaser for you about some great news. So um, the library just this week, um, we took in a little bit more from the News Gazette. Um, this is part of the um, News Gazette Foundation collection that was purchased um, by the Champaign County History Museum. And they have asked, they asked us to take on um, Marijan Stavik Kinnego's personal collection. So it's about 30 boxes of archival materials. Um, I was told by Perry Morris, who's the vice president of the board there, that um, about six or seven of those boxes are what he calls Marijan's snapshots. Um, apparently, I, I have heard tell that she did not see a camera or find a camera that did not love her. So she loved to be photographed and to take photographs. So we're very excited for this. Um, I'm looking forward to um, possibly this in the spring semester, having an intern or practicum student take on that collection as their big project um, and to pull out some of those interesting pieces. So more to come. We just uh, went and grabbed it on Sunday. So I'm not even sure what we have yet. Um, but we definitely wanted to take it. Um, it's a great addition to our News Gazette holdings as well. Great. Donica, could I just add, um, I'm really glad that the archives is collecting the materials uh, from the, I don't know if you want to call it unrest or uh, let's be more positive, <laughs> the demonstrations locally. Sure. I'm just, so what are you calling that collection? Um, we've called it documenting racial justice in Champaign yeah. County. Okay. Um, so this is going to be a, a community donated, um, kind of an artificial collection of community donations um, that we hoped to get um, digital and physical materials. We've been in contact with a couple of donors who are going to donate, um, you know, larger material, larger um, collections of photos and things like that. Um, but we're hoping to get 
you know, individual submissions as well. Great. Yeah, I put the news out to the WUNA list. I think it's a really great idea. Thank Thanks. you. Any other items, Celeste? Nope, that's it for us, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Um, don't see any committee reports that I know of. I have nothing to contribute in extra. Um, I didn't see no unfinished business. No new business. Is there any new business anybody has? Seeing no further business to come before this board, I declare the meeting adjourned.